we can no longer tinker around the edges. We know what to do, but now we need the courage to actually do it. So finally, I want to share with you a story, a much loved story um, by The Arch, written by the US author Laureen Isolay, which seems a fitting point to conclude. Now, it is about a man who's throwing a starfish into the sea. Millions of starfish have washed up on the sand. Now, what difference does it make for you to throw one back? The man is asked. And he replies, it makes a huge difference for that starfish. We had lost our way, I thought, but we had kept some of us the memory of the perfect circle of compassion. From life to death and back to life again, the story concludes. Now it is my great privilege and honor on behalf of all board members of the Tutu Legacy Foundation to officially welcome you all to our 10th annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture. A very warm welcome to all our friends in South Africa and globally. This evening's 10th annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture is very important in new and profound ways. Not just because it's being digitally broadcast from across the globe rather than taking place in Cape Town, but because the event is happening at a time of extraordinary vulnerability for all the world's people and for our Earth. Who could have imagined on 7th of October, the Archer's birthday last year, that 365 days later, humanity would find itself fighting a historic pandemic. An economy crushing health catastrophe, exposing all our stark inequalities. On this precipice, we have arrived at a critical crossroads. The choices we now face matter more to our survival than any choices we've ever encountered before. Choosing the subject of the 10th Annual International Peace Lecture was moot. Last year we covered the critical topic of corruption. The message was quite simple. Just say no. This year's topic is equally relevant. The Tutu Foundation united with the South African Council of Churches, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, the Foundation for Human Rights, the Ahmed Katada Foundation, and the Council for the Advancement of the Constitution to say, no more stealing the future and the health of our people. I always thought that Desmond Tutu, Rabbi Raza for Peace, a book title of an authorized biography of the art, was such an apt characterization of him. I inquired its origins and was told that at a fiery rally at Jabulani Stadium in Soweto, to welcome the Rivonia trialists, and before Madiba himself was released, the Arch's fierce rhetoric prevailed. At that assembly, Mama Albertina Sisulu greeted the Arch and said to him, in good humor, you're just a rabble man. Apparently she'd always called him that. I asked where the peace part came from and was told the Arch's purpose was to address the crowds of young people at the rally with his impassioned call for justice and equality that day, and then steer that passionate energy and anger into constructive action. In that tradition, the Tutu Foundation is continuing the Archie's rabble-rousing and living legacy. We will continue to stand against corruption at all levels, whether individual, business or government. We will continue to raise our voice against gender-based violence. And we will continue to shine a light on courageous and ethical leaders who dare speak truth as they fight for justice, fairness, tolerance and equality, especially for the poorest and the most vulnerable in our nation and our world. Each generation delivers a handful of people who stand out from the crowd. Environmental advocate Vanessa Nakate from Uganda, and our own Ayaka Melitafa from Cape Town. We thank all of you for joining us. So young and yet so visionary, fighting for the survival of our earth, 
speaking truth with courage to unite and protecting our burning planet Earth, as others seek to divide and destroy it. And two of you are still students. Remarkable. For the Arches Foundation tonight, focusing on climate justice is important because it creates a bridge between the legacy of a global icon of both great thinking and doing. As I stand here at the Desmond and Dea Tutu Legacy Building today, we say to young people and all who are listening across the world that whilst the land, waters and skies of our earth have been made toxic by the deadly legacies of the past, we join you in advocating the end to this prolonged pandemic of planetary poisoning. On the eve of the Arches upcoming 90th year, we have just established a new Tutu Fund as we campaign to inspire a youth-led drive for positive change. In addition to our public advocacy work, we aim to gather, collate and digitally archive the Arches life's work and legacy from around the world to make it accessible and to inspire and inform future generations, to nourish new leaders, to champion the medicine of respect and justice for all people, to continually reinsert values and humanity into the equations we face. We are not without hope. We have both old and new maps to pursue a better future. We have accumulated knowledge, our innate courage and compassion. It's a visionary project set in a historic building in Cape Town that we aim to transform into a tutu museum as well as an online learning portal to carry on the artist's knowledge and action legacy. In conclusion, the Desmond and Leia Tutu Legacy Foundation seeks to activate his teachings for social justice, to transform our fear and despair into healing and courage for future generations. Good evening everyone, my name is Aya Kameli Tafa, I am a climate justice activist from South Africa. I became an activist after my community was severely affected by a drought that hit my province. I saw a problem and decided to act by advocating for urgent climate justice in my country. I have been protesting with fellow activists in Cape Town and had a direct encounter with our president, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa. And he promised us that he was going to make sure that no African child is left behind in the 100% just transition to renewable energy. And we will make sure that he keeps that promise. I also attended the World Economic Forum to urge world leaders to take drastic action in addressing the climate crisis. To the young people of South Africa, my message to you is this. We need to stop being passive. We need to stop putting each other down and criticizing each other. We are powerful beyond measure. And together, we will truly make powerful and effective change. If we stand up, take up space, and move as a unit, we will be able to correct all of the socioeconomic injustices that we are currently facing as a country. The first young woman is Vanessa Nakate, a Ugandan climate justice activist that decided to take action in her community after she became concerned about the unusually high temperatures in her country. She is a founder in the Rise Up movement, where she encourages us to stand up, to speak up and to act as we do not have time because we really do not. She is also a founder in the One Million Activist Stories, sharing world experiences of global activists. After Vanessa got cropped out of a picture with her fellow white activists at the World Economic Forum, that gave her the drive to advocate for more inclusion and diversity into the climate movement and incorporate more voices from the Global South and make sure that they are heard. The 10th annual Desmond Tutu Peace Lecture is providing a platform for these two dynamic and powerful young voices for climate justice to provide leadership for a better future. I hand it over to you, Vanessa, my sister in activism. Greetings to you all. My name is Vanessa Nakate and I'm a climate activist from Uganda. I am happy to be speaking with all of you today at the 10th International Peace Lecture. 
I would like to wish a happy birthday to the Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu on his 89th birthday. I started doing activism in the first week of January 2019 after seeing and researching about how climate change was affecting the people in my country. I went on to understand how it specifically affects the African continent. And I realized that the climate crisis was the greatest threat facing humanity. Africa is the lowest emitter of CO2 emissions of all continents, but it is among the most affected by the climate crisis. Climate change greatly affects the water resources, food security, infrastructure, ecosystems, and the people. We have seen devastating impacts of climate change in Africa, for example, the droughts and the floods. With the increasing global temperatures, the weather patterns are being disrupted, causing shorter and heavier rainy seasons and longer and hotter dry seasons. The heavy rainfall has led to floods in different parts of the continent, leading to much devastation and destruction of people's livelihoods. Many people have lost their lives, while many have lost their homes, farms and businesses. Cyclone Idai was one of the worst cyclones to affect the African continent, leaving a lot of damage in Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi. The heavy rainfall and strong winds left more than 1,300 people dead and many more were recorded as missing. Everything was reduced to rubble. All that was left was an economic crisis. This year we witnessed the water levels of Lake Victoria rise as a result of the heavy rainfall in East Africa. The water flooded homes of people, displaced people, washed away farms, submerged toilets and led to a water and food crisis. We also saw an invasion of locusts in East Africa and these were linked to the heavy rainfall experienced and the warm temperatures as a result of the global rise in temperatures. The locusts led to massive destruction of crops as they ate everything that was grown. This threatened the availability of food for the people in the region. And in September, we saw massive flooding in Sudan that killed nearly a hundred people and leaving thousands homeless. The Nile regularly busts its banks and farmers rely on the flood waters to create fertile land. But people who live along the Nile have never seen anything like the extent of this year's flooding. Drought threatens millions of people in Africa. Southern Africa has experienced terrible droughts that have led to food insecurity and water scarcity. I remember talking to a friend and an activist from Zimbabwe who told me that water was very valuable to them because they have been at a point of struggling to get it. The water levels of Zambezi River, Lake Chad and Victoria Falls are lower than they have been for decades. Lake Chad specifically has shrunk to a tenth of its original size in just 50 years. Over five years of droughts in countries like Somalia have left almost half of the population without anything to eat or water to drink. The droughts have left nothing behind for the people except agony, pain, suffering, starvation and death. Because no rain means hunger and death for many people. Most countries in Africa heavily depend on rain for their agriculture, for example the Western Cape region of South Africa. Unfortunately, this region has seen heavy droughts which have affected crop growth. These droughts have been caused by poor rainfall and this has led to water stress and scarcity in countries like South Africa. And because of this, we have seen many water use restrictions put in place. 
People do not have to live like this. South Africa is Africa's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. But South Africa also has a rare influence for an African country. They need to use their position in the G20 and BRICS countries to fight for the affected people throughout Africa on the global stage. What does climate change mean for Africa? It means food crisis, it means water crisis. Half of Nigeria has no access to water. And according to Oxfam, 12 million people in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia are in dire need of food. But with the escalating climate disasters, the number is going to increase, with many people struggling to eat. Remember that for every 1% increase in drought, there is a 2.4% decrease in agricultural output. And a family will go hungry and a child will sleep hungry. None deserves this. No child deserves to live this way. Congo rainforest, which is the largest rainforest in Africa, faces massive deforestation and yet over 80 million people heavily depend on its existence. Over 10,000 animals call this place home and it has over 10,000 species of plants. This forest is the only home for the forest giraffe, also known as the Okapi. Through the Safe Congo Rainforest Strike, we are demanding for the protection of the lungs of Africa. Many of these communities in Africa are also being threatened by increasing conflicts as a result of climate change. With every decline in natural resources, such as food or water, there is going to be a struggle among communities for the limited resources. Migration as a result of displacement, increased exposure of women and girls to gender-based violence, child recruitment into army offices is most likely going to be exacerbated by the effects of climate change. The vulnerability of the most affected communities never seems to end. They are threatened by diseases as they face climate disasters. Many children are most likely going to face malnutrition because of lack of food to eat. They face a risk of starvation and death. The floods also exacerbate the spread of malaria in different parts of Africa. When toilets were submerged by the rise in the water levels of Lake Victoria, water sources were contaminated, hence putting a risk in the rise of diseases such as cholera and diarrhea in this region. This increases the death rates of children below the age of five. Climate change is a nightmare that affects every sector of our lives. We need to actually wake up and see these things see these realities and see how much people are suffering as a result of the climate crisis. We will not be able to achieve any sustainable development goal without addressing the issue of climate change. We cannot eradicate poverty because most of the people in these communities that are affected the most are already living in poor conditions and climate change only makes their situations worse. So how can we eradicate poverty without looking at this crisis? How can we achieve zero hunger if climate change is leaving millions of people with nothing to eat? How can we protect the life on land and the life underwater without climate action? We cannot have gender equality without addressing this crisis, this catastrophe. Most of the rural communities have women do and handle most of the family chores of putting food on the table and fetching water for their families. But
But with all these increasing disasters, they must work double to recover what has been lost. They must walk long distances to collect water in case of a crisis. This puts them at a risk of getting back X, at a risk of gender-based violence as they walk these long distances to fetch water. This is a challenge. I read an article that was talking about child brides. It was stating that when a family is affected and hit by a climate disaster and they lose everything, they are forced to give up some of their children for marriage. And who else but the girl child, since they can receive a bride price in return? Our girls are being given up for marriage because their families are losing everything to climate change. We cannot have any more child brides. We cannot have women walk long distances for water. Women and girls must not be exposed anymore to gender-based violence. Leaders must do something about the climate crisis. Many students stand at a risk of their education being affected since they have to drop out of school to help their parents recover all that has been lost to climate change. Many have to leave school and work in farms, while others have to leave school since their parents are not able to take care of their school expenses. How can we have a future without education? Every child deserves to go to school. Every child deserves to be in school. Enough is enough. This must change. Everything has to change. I know that we need to find new solutions. I know that there are clean energy technologies that need further research and development and funding. But we also need to massively increase funding for the things we know will work. Project Jordan lists the top 100 activities that would contribute the most to the goal of reducing emissions. Ranked number six is an initiative that is rarely talked about in environmental circles, educating girls. Just beneath it is the connected issue of family planning at number seven. The education of girls and family planning can be considered as a single issue involving the empowerment of women in communities across the world. Project Jordan calculated that by taking steps towards universal education and investing in family planning in developing nations, we could result in a massive reduction in emissions of 51.48 gigatons by 2050. That is roughly 10 years worth of China's annual emissions, and it's all because the world's population won't rise quite so rapidly. Educating girls has an impact beyond the individual, cascading into her family and her community. Research shows that women with higher levels of good quality education marry later and have fewer and healthier children, live longer and enjoy greater economic prosperity. Why is no one talking about this? Why are we not doing this? We need to be excited about educating and empowering girls as the next shiny technological solution. We need to fund education for girls and family planning, and we need to do it on a massive scale, and we need to start now. The current crisis is not something that is coming in the future. You must treat this as a crisis. Leaders must realize that the climate change issue is an urgent issue. It is a serious issue and now is the time for them to face the climate emergency. We are in the anthropogenic age and we are going to see disaster after disaster, challenge after challenge, suffering after suffering, extinction of species, destruction of ecosystems and communities if nothing is done about this. You must be asking yourself how we are going to survive this and build a better future for the world. First of all, leaders must acknowledge that we are 
in a crisis and start treating it as a crisis. The people and the planet must come first before anything else. If you do not treat climate change as a crisis, then you will not do what is necessary for us to get out of this mess. It is time for leaders to leave their comfort zones and see the danger that we are in and do something about it. This is a matter of life and death. We are showing you the direction. There are two choices we present to you today, life and death. Choose life for the people. Choose life for the ecosystems. Choose life for the planet. Be part of the change. Be part of the transformation. Use your voice. Use your platform. Use your resources. Use your position. Do not be silent at a time like this. This fight needs everyone. If we are united, if we work together, if we demand for climate justice, we will be able to transform the world and make it a better place. Thank you. Dear Archbishop Tutu, happy birthday. Dear Mrs. Tutu, board, staff, and friends of the Tutu Foundation. Thanks very much to everyone for tuning in. And above all, thanks very much for inviting me to join the 10th year anniversary of the Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture. Now, as it is your 10th anniversary, I actually thought it would be quite appropriate to look at the next 10 years and beyond. But before we do that, could we just cast a quick glance on where we are right now in the year 2020. Now, in order to cast a glance, I invite you in your mind's eye to picture a beach where there are adults, not children, adults sitting on the beach with their back to the ocean and building sandcastles. And unbeknownst to them, there is a wave that is coming toward the beach, and that wave is entitled the health crisis. Behind that wave, there is a greater wave that is coming toward the beach, and that wave is entitled the economic crisis. Behind that one, there is a larger wave entitled the biodiversity crisis. And behind the biodiversity crisis, there is a wave that is 10 times higher, 10 times longer than all of the first waves. And that is entitled the climate change crisis. Now, what is sadly unseen it, by everyone is not just that the adults have their backs turned to these crises coming at them, but that underneath all of those waves, there is an undercurrent that is part and parcel of all of those waves being affected by the waves and multiplying those waves. And that underlying current is inequality. So here we are in 2020, sitting on the sand with our backs to those crises because we have refused to look squarely into those crises for such a long time. Those crises have now converged in the year 2020. We did not ask for those crises to converge, but they have. Now, as Archbishop Tutu has taught us, we learn from history that we don't learn from history. And yet, the convergence of the crises in 2020 is, has made 2020 a year that if we humans won't remember, at least history will remember. 
because it is the year of the convergence of the crises. And hence, we have to ensure that we make it the year of the convergence of the solutions. We do not have the time or the financial capacity around the world to deal with each of these crises individually and sequentially. We have no other option but to bring them together in a harmonious whole and address them in an integrated fashion. That is why it is so critical that the economic recovery packages that are being designed and distributed and invested into all countries now to come out of the original health crisis. These economic recovery packages must be green and they must be inclusive because that is the only way that we're actually going to be able to converge the solutions to the crises that have now converged on the year 2020. Now, from today, from 2020, looking out onto the horizon into the future, what do we see? Well, we see that we have already started what scientists and many others are already beginning to call the decisive decade, the decade of the 20s. Why? Because it is precisely over the next 10 years that we collectively are going to be deciding what the quality of life on this planet is going to be, not for a couple of decades, but very likely for hundreds of years. That may sound like an exaggeration, but it's not. It is no exaggeration that this is the decisive decade in the history of humankind. By 2030, we will either have continued business as usual, which is what we've been doing for the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years, continuing to emit greenhouse gases at the level that we are, in which case, if we continue on this business as usual, by 2030, we will have condemned the world to constant and increasing destruction of infrastructure, of communities, of disappearance of communities because of sea level rise, of increasing fires, which we have seen rampant this year, of storms, of hurricanes, of floods. We will have condemned everyone to a world that is increasingly uninhabitable, to a world where drought continues to make expanding areas uninhabitable because of the lack of water and incapacity to grow food. In all of those areas, we will see forced migration, not because people want to leave where they have grown up, where they were born, where their cultures are, where the bones of their ancestors are buried. They don't want to leave. We don't want to leave where we were born. But if, the, if our areas become uninhabitable, there will be forced migration, the likes of which we have never seen. We will also, because we will be spurred by the need to survive, we will be forced into individualism, the likes of which we have never seen. We would be creating social pressure and hence political conflict like we have never seen, all ending up in human misery. Now, are we condemned to that world? Do we have to accept that that is our only future? Absolutely not. And that is the good news. Over the, ten, the next 10 years, we can and we must 
cut greenhouse gas emissions by 50% globally, especially in industrialized countries who have the responsibility to cut much more than their 50% in order to give space for others. But as a collective humanity, we have to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. And my friends, if we do that, and there's no reason why we couldn't, if we do that, then by 2030, we will have opened the door to a world that is not just not the dystopian world that I have just described. It is actually a world that is much better than the world that we live in now. It is a world in which the air in all cities is clean and fresh. It is a world in which cities are organized for people, not for cars and streets. It is a world in which cities are green and there is food being produced in the cities. It is a world in which transport is clean and efficient. It is a world in which we have clean and cheap energy being produced and is ubiquitous, accessible to all, especially to the 800 million people who today do not have electricity. Because by that, by, because with that, we will be able to electrify everyone through renewable energies. It is a world in which we will be able to regenerate degraded soils, making them more productive and allowing for us to produce food for everyone. It is a world in which we will move from scarcity to abundance, from competition to collaboration and solidarity, from individualism to community. And it is a world in which we will see the sprouting of the seeds of more peace. Now, I don't think I need to ask anyone here, which of those two worlds would you prefer? Obviously, we all prefer the much, much better world that we can create. But here is the determining factor. Over the next 10 years, in fact, 10 years minus nine months because we're already, or 10 months because we're already in October. Nine years minus 10 months. Collectively, we are already choosing which world we're going to have. We may be choosing consciously or unconsciously, but either way, we are making the choice. By 2030, that choice will have been made. Now, am I hopeful that we can do this? Yes, because as we have learned from Archbishop Tutu, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. And let's admit, there is a lot of darkness right now, especially on geopolitics. But it is our responsibility to hold the light, to hold the bright candle in the moments of this darkness. And I am hopeful that we are choosing the better world. I rest my premise and my hope and my optimism on two foundational pillars. The first, scientific clarity. We have never had as much scientific clarity as to the trajectory of humankind and of this planet as we do now. The second is my staunch belief and my staunch faith in human agency in the fact that we do have the collectively, not individually, but collectively, we do have the ingenuity, the capacity for innovation, the determination, the will, the wherewithal to make the right choice and give all of those that are coming to join us, all our future brothers and sisters, give them the world that they deserve. Now, as we look on to the next 10 years, it may seem like it is an overwhelming challenge. I agree. 
However, let us understand that we are, as a humanity, in a moment of huge transition, deep transition. And all transitions are messy by definition. In every transition, you have evidence of the past, and we do have a lot of evidence of the past, of what we have been doing over the past 50 years. I don't need to enumerate because it is in our news feed every day. But in a transition, you also have evidence of the future. And it is our responsibility to very consciously look for the evidence of the future that is already emerging in the present. In the current moment, we can already see those seeds of the future that we want to create. So let me give you a couple of examples of trends that frankly were already nascent even before the COVID effect, but that arguably the COVID effect has accelerated them. A couple of examples, I'll give you five. First, consumption of goods is slowly but surely morphing into access of a service. Think of the revolution that is underway in transport, where in many countries, there is no longer this desire to acquire two wheels or four wheels, but rather we have understood that what we want with those four wheels or those two wheels is to transport ourselves from A to B. And we're beginning to understand that that is the important part of it. And hence, we're beginning to let go, not everywhere and not, um, and not at equal speed, but we're beginning to let go of our need to own those wheels and rather to access those services. We're also beginning to dematerialize music, for example. We used to have things, CDs, LPs, DVDs, um, and today we access music through a finger click. Think of the way we're doing banking, internet banking. Uh, think of the way we're accessing information. There used to be physical things called libraries. Today we access information through the click of a finger as well. So consumption of goods is morphing into the access of services. Second, we are slowly beginning to understand that the extraction model that has been at the basis of our economic model is coming to a close and that we are we are having to move over now because we have reached planetary boundaries we're having to move over to the circular economy in which we don't necessarily continue to extract but rather we optimize our resources thirdly Centralization is no longer the ultimate goal. We're beginning to understand that decentralization is perhaps much more useful to all of us as long as there's universal accessibility. Think of renewable energy, think of the huge power plants that we used to have, coal plants, that then very centralized energy generation, and then we needed these long distribution lines to take energy to every single home. Well, we don't need that anymore. We, we are decentralizing energy and we can put a little solar model on the roof of every single home around the world. Decentralized and universally accessible energy would not have been possible without renewable energy, without the technologies that we have today. Fourth, we are at the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's doctrine on shareholder primacy, in which our economy and our corporations have been operating for such a long time, assuming that the only thing that was important was to bring profits to shareholders. Today, we are more slowly but surely moving over to what I would call much more of a stakeholder primacy, where we understand that corporations and the financial sector need to have people, planet, and profit. Yes, profit also needs to be there, but people and planet need to be in equal standing because otherwise these corporations will have no 
social license to operate and no place in a future economy. And finally, and quite excitingly, the speed of change is increasing. We used to think about change in a linear fashion. That is no longer the case. We're now moving over to exponential change. And that is what makes me most hopeful that we will be able to get to 2030 having halved our emissions. Now, let me conclude by saying that this optimism, this hope, this faith that we can do what is necessary. Let us understand that that is not the result of any achievement that we have had in the past. It is rather the input that we need to hold firmly with determination, the input to any challenge. It is frankly a decision that we have to make every single day. It is our staunch conviction that we do have the ingenuity, the determination, the agency to do what is necessary to ensure that everyone, everyone has a promising future. Today, there are 1.3 billion people in Africa by 2050, which is when we have to be at net zero emissions, having passed the 2030 mark of halving our emissions, then go to 2050, which is net zero emissions worldwide. By then, Africa will be the most populous continent in the world. One in four people on earth will be African. Let us remember and let us commit to ensuring that each one of them has a world that thrives because that is what every person deserves. Now, inspired by the words and the work of Vanessa and Ayaka, let us remember that what we have here in front of us is not an effort to try to save humanity. Rather, it is our discovery of the depth of our humanity. This is not about doing our best. This is not about sitting back and going, oh, well, I did my best. No, this is about doing everything that is necessary. Because in the difference between doing our best and doing everything that is necessary. Therein lies the future of life on Earth. Thank you very much. And again, happy birthday, dear Arch. Hello, I'm very excited to be taking part in the 10th Desmond Tutu Peace Lecture from here at my home in Tennessee in the United States. And I want to start by wishing my dear friend Arch a happy 89th birthday. Now I want to caution you Arch, don't think of turning 89 as almost nine tenths of a century. Think of it as less than one tenth of a millennium. I really wish that we were together in person to celebrate this important day. And thank you for the opportunity to stand together with you on that occasion to call on nations and companies and investors around the world to divest from fossil fuels. So many people around the world deeply appreciate your leadership and moral courage in our struggle to solve the climate crisis. I hope your birthday is a great one, and I can't wait until we can reunite in person again. Now, to everyone watching at home, I'm glad that you are also here to listen to our youth who are leading the way in the world's fight against the climate crisis. Many youth leaders around the world, like Vanessa Nakate and Ayaka Melitafa, are raising public consciousness to brand new levels and are pushing political leaders to develop bolder and more ambitious ideas to confront this existential challenge. One of the lessons of my years as a young member of Congress in the United States was when I learned that although change can sometimes come from the top, 
more often the biggest changes start at the grassroots level because political leaders start paying attention if the calls for action from the people are loud and persistent and unyielding. In fact, if you look back at the great social movements in history, women's suffrage, civil rights, the anti-apartheid movement, uh, women's rights, more recently gay and lesbian rights, individual activists have been driving these movements uh, and building grassroots support and the movements have so often been led by students. The students are staging sit-ins at government offices, marching in the streets, protesting on, and the youth of today are rightly and justly demanding a brighter and better future. They're embracing the challenge as if their lives depend on it, because they do. And the rest of us must follow their lead and act before it's too late. I'm heartened by the arch and by his continued to resol resolve to lead by example through his foundation and through the newly unveiled Tutu Legacy Fund. This fund is being launched today to secure Archbishop Tutu's magnificent legacy for the future and to foster a new youth-led drive for positive change in Africa and around the world. In support of the fund's establishment, a 90 at 90 campaign is being launched, which aims to raise 90 million rand during Archbishop Tutu's 90th year. Through the example of his own life and work, the Arch has brought the light of kindness, justice, and healing, where once the darkness of hate, injustice, and cruelty reigned. He's inspired us all. He's given his all in pursuit of this inspiring mission. Now the time has come as Archbishop Emeritus Tutu enter his 90th, enters his 90th year to take up the torch and make sure that it is passed on to the next generation. So I encourage you to give if you can, and to give more if you can, and to act against the injustices in this world, including the climate crisis. And if you ever start to lose hope during these unprecedented times, always remember that the will to act is itself a renewable resource. Happy birthday, Arch. Good evening, Dada and Malia. Good evening, Vanessa and Greta. And greetings to everyone in your worldwide audience. A happy birthday to you today, Arch. And to you, Mama Leah, for next week. Arch, we look forward to celebrating your 90th birthday next year. And we thank God for bringing both of you through the recent fire and protecting you. The Foundation's theme is Courage to Heal, which is completely appropriate since you've always had the courage to heal. For too long, faith communities have seen healing as being something which happens between people. For too long we have regarded the earth as something to exploit, but now we are seeing that the earth too needs to be healed, and that healing our relationship with the earth is as important to our survival as healing our relationship with each other. Data, you have been in the forefront of religious leaders who recognize this. You are also known for being the voice of the voiceless. Since the earth can speak only through storms, wind, fire and earthquakes, it is up to us to speak out to protect our world. Young people are now standing up and their voices need to be amplified. We are proud that the Duty Foundation is playing this significant role in giving this platform to young people. God bless you all. And once again, a happy birthday to you, Tata, and to Malia. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious. On behalf of the Muslim Judicial Council, we congratulate our icon, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, today, the 7th of October, on his 89th birthday. What a momentous journey! We salute you 
for your tireless contribution to our rainbow nation, to the African continent, and to the broader community. Let me further say, as Muslims, we are compelled by the glorious Quran and by the prophetic teachings to respect the earth. For indeed the earth is placed in our care as an amana, a trust, which we must respect. Therefore, we have the responsibility and duty to create a better environment for future generations to come by changing our behavior. In Islam, there's a clear call for action against climate change. Let us make the dua and pray and say, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Oh Allah, we start in your name, the most merciful, the most gracious. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We thank you, the Lord of the entire universe. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. The most merciful, the most gracious. Maliki Yawmiddin. The king of the day of reckoning. We thank you for blessing us with such personalities like Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And we ask you that you bless him with the best of health for whatever remains in his journey in this earth. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Dear Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Happy 89th birthday. What a blessing it is for millions of people on the African continent, in South Africa, and all around the world that you have been with us for all these years and for the amazing contribution, leadership, and inspiration you offered to us. You inspired us to struggle against just injustice with love, with kindness, with compassion, and as you always reminded us, hope uh, when you always proudly said that you are a prisoner of hope myself and many other young people in south africa owe so much to you for inspiring us to stand up for justice i heard you speak for the first time when i was 16 years old in durban when you inspired us in ways that i cannot even describe there was almost tears coming down our eyes when we heard you spoke. Some of the tears were also coming because we were laughing so much because you always had a way to make us laugh through all the sadness and all the struggles. And thank you for that. Because if we are going to address the climate crisis, which threatens humanity's very existence on the planet, we're going to need hope, we're going to need kindness, we're going to need love, we're going to need compassion. All the things that your life and your life's work has taught us so eloquently. And from the bottom of, the, of my heart, and I know I speak for millions of people, not only in South Africa, but around the world, Siabonga Kakulu, thank you very, very much. Thank you also for honoring two incredible young women. Together with other young leaders, they have inspired millions to bring urgency to the climate crisis. An urgency that you recognize more than a decade ago when you started out speaking for action. Sadly, far too many of the most powerful governments in the world failed to speak up, failed to act. But young people have brought a sense of moral urgency and this lecture offers the opportunity to inspire parents to reciprocate as our children have done and show that we can also stand up in the same way that our children are standing up before it's too late. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, we love you and we wish you the most happiest of 89th birthday. Thank you. Greetings. What a joy to take part in the 10th Desmond Tutu Peace Lecture. Let me begin by wishing my dear friends Arch and Leah happy birthdays close together. It was great to see Arch in such good form in January when we met. And this annual lecture is an important tribute to his work for peace, human rights and a sustainable world. 
I remember Arch explaining the meaning of the African philosophy of Ubuntu as being simply, I am because you are. The notion that my humanity is bound up in yours. This reminds me of a favoured Irish shanokal, an old word, is our scotha chela a warren nadini. It's in each other's shadow that we flourish. You can find similar expressions of solidarity all over the world. Yet, though we speak words of shared humanity, we have failed to listen to one another, and we have failed to listen to Mother Earth. Nature is in great peril. She's speaking to us every day through burning forests, melting ice caps, rising sea levels, floods and droughts. And those living on the front lines of climate change, least responsible for the crisis, are losing lives and livelihoods. If we really listen to the young people, they are asking us not to listen to them at all. They're asking us to listen to the incontrovertible science. They're asking us to take our words of shared humanity and turn them into concrete, urgent action if we're to ensure that we limit climate change to 1.5 degrees. This intergenerational gathering of voices today should remind us all that we are inextricably bound to each other and should reaffirm the old wisdom of shared humanity. We need to listen, we need to act. If we truly stand in solidarity with our children and grandchildren, then we need to urgently end the fossil fuel era and start building a sustainable, just, inclusive world together. Happy birthday, Archbishop Tutu. My name is Mor Gilboa. I live in Tel Aviv. It is a great honor to address you, thank you, and wish you from the bottom of my heart a very happy 89th birthday. Toda ala manigutta amitza shelcha veatmicha bamaavak lezedek aklimi. On behalf of myself and One Climate Movement, I wish to thank you for your courageous leadership and support in the historic struggle for climate justice. Only by ending all oppression, occupation and corruption, we will be able to stop the climate crisis. Thank you for reminding us that freedom, independence, justice and equal rights are critical components in our way to stop the climate catastrophe the world is facing. We cannot protect the climate if we will be blind to all kinds of injustices around us. I wish that all the people between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea will fight to protect the planet and struggle together for justice, reconciliation and peace for all of us here in this burning region. Archibishof Tutu, may your light continue to shine to the Middle East and to the whole world from the southernmost part of Africa. Mazal Tov, Shalom, Salam. Happy birthday, Arch and Mama Lea. It's wonderful to, to see you again this year, even though everything is virtual now, as you know, and I'm sure you've already figured out how to use Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams and all the platforms that bring us all together these days. Tzitzi is also here with me to say happy birthday. Go on, Tzitzi. Absolutely. Happy birthday, Archbishop Tutu, and happy birthday to Mama Lea. We are so excited to be celebrating your birthday, your lives, and just the impact you've had on all of us, our children, and communities all over the world. What a pleasure to say happy birthday. God bless you mightily. I, I remember the five years ago when Richard Branson and myself and Shannon, uh, we, we sneaked in on you, Arch, and uh, to, with a big cake, remember that? And we had such a wonderful time. Uh, we have a picture which we actually keep on our mantelpiece here at our house of that amazing time we had with you. It was such a wonderful family time. Uh, but anyway, you know, we also remember the Peace Lecture and how you came and honored our, my, my coming to make that lecture at the time we spent together. And I know that this year you are also 
uh, you have invited some amazing young people. And you know, seeing these young people, uh, you know, talking about climate change, such an, a, a big issue, and yet they carry it almost with the voice of God. Because this is a time of such great threat to the world, both with the pandemic and the ever presence of climate change. And you know, we're proud of these young people because they're in a way, they are your successors, Arch and Mamalia. Look at their energy, look at their passion. They mirror you. And we know just like you had the impossible task of, of, of midwifing a nation, South Africa, through apartheid and into reconciliation. So shall it be with these young people to take the world out of this nightmare of climate change. But once again, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Stay safe. And we'll see you hopefully at Christmas. We're thinking of Cape Town, that we will come back uh, and that the pandemic by then we will have managed to take a big step towards containing it. But stay safe and thank you. We love you. Thank you. God bless you. It is my joy, a very special joy, to offer Archbishop Desmond our blessings on his 89th birthday. Happy birthday, Chesey, and for waves of grace to reach on to Andrea's anniversary of life on the 14th of this month. Mawawa! In his role as my predecessor, as SSC General Secretary, Archbishop Desmond helped a young and confused Malusi Mpumulwana enter the Federal Theological Seminary for a theology degree, paid for by the SACC and supported by the British Christian Aid. Thank you, Chasey. I'll never forget that. It is my privilege for me to say today that you must remain and be our conscience, the SACC and your own foundation, the Tutu Foundation. Never to betray your legacy. And that is why we have to support the Tutu Legacy Fund that is being launched today. The Tutu Legacy Fund will secure Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu's example for the future generations. And as part of the Foundation's efforts to ensure that they foster a new and youth-driven campaign and efforts for public good in society, both in Africa and globally. Challenging this our generation, Archbishop Desmond says, we don't have an excuse. We cannot claim that we do not know the impact of climate change on the dreams of the future generations of young people to whom he had said, reach for your stars, for now you can become anything and you can do anything that God has given for you to be able to do. So we have no excuse. This fund, in support of this effort, we have a 90 at 90 campaign that has been mounted to ensure that we raise about 90 million rand, some 4 million US dollars, during the year, the 90th year of Archbishop Desmond's life. The SACC, which proudly shares the legacy of the Tutus with the Desmond and Lea Tutu Legacy Foundation, will support this effort as part of our broader collaboration between the two organizations as the children of the Tutus. Tomorrow, on the 8th of October, the SACC is hosting a webinar, special webinar 
on economic inclusion. And this will be in recognition of the man who through his indefatigable ministry became a source of hope for those economically excluded people in the world, the excluded majority in South Africa and the rest of the world. This fund and this campaign is aimed at addressing the urgent need to secure the legacy of the arch and ensure that there are fresh waves of people, young people that are joining the Tutu legacy. Through his example and his own life and work as an SSC leader and as a bishop of the church, including his campaign against the evil of apartheid. Desmond Tutu gave everything, just everything for the success of this mission. He brought light, the light of Christ, the light of kindness, of justice, and of healing. In an environment of the darkness of hatred, injustice, and cruelty, both in South Africa and the world. This prisoner of hope, for he is forever a prisoner of hope. He is the time has come for that hope to be the mission of all those who will endorse this campaign today. The time has come, Kinako, Kesha, Lifikile, that as Archbishop Desmond Tutu reaches his 90th year, we should all take up the torch, make sure it is passed on from generation to generation, and that through the 90th and 90th, will create the pathway, the channel for that to reach the next generation and the next generation so that all of us into the future will continue to say there was a Desmond Tutu in South Africa. Chase! I'd like to thank you all for being part of this 10th International Tutu Lecture. We're very excited but also honoured and privileged to have been able to learn, to see things through sharper eyes, as it were. Thank you so very much, Vanessa and Ayaka. Continue to cause good trouble. A special thanks to those who send support messages. Siobonga. Thank you so much to the Libertas Choir from Stellenbosch who gave so freely of themselves. And a very special thanks to Claude Collart and his team who ensured that all the technical aspects were professionally done. A most special thanks to our platinum sponsor, the Matsepe Foundation, and also to Old Mutual and other sponsors, and those who contributed online. Without your contributions, this event would not have been possible. It's especially wonderful that South African companies and foundations have seen the importance of tonight's peace lecture. Thank you to the media for covering this event, and this would not have been possible without you either. Arch and Mama Leah, happy birthday to both of you. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and invite you to continue with us on our journey. Until next year, goodbye. May he bless you and guide you on heaven's way. It's a prayer and a greeting. Happy birthday to you. Feels geluk, lieve Desmond, omdat jij verjaar. Mag die Heer jou zien en nog bij je jaren spaar. Menem naan die Minem nan di kuwe, minem nan di kudesmond, minem nan di kuwe. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to. Happy birthday, dear Desmond. Happy birthday to you.
and indeed a happy 89th birthday to the arch so much tribute uh, uh, there Francis uh, from the former vice president of the United States Al Gore one of the elders uh, the former president of Ireland you know him being lauded as a voice of uh, the voiceless by many but taking center stage the issue of climate change and m almost all the speakers there say it's critical that economic recovery under these current circumstances, you know, are, are recovery packages that are green and inclusive. So yeah. uh, that, that's key to uh, part of that message uh, there this evening. So just a reminder of some of those speakers, um, a climate change activist uh, from Costa Rica, uh, Christiana Figueres, Vanessa Nakate from Uganda, and our own Ayaka Melitafa. And one of the images there was so powerful. Yeah. So if we think of um, the economic crisis as a wave and COVID-19 as the next wave, uh, climate change or a lack of action on climate change is, is a bigger wave behind that, a, a coming yeah. tsunami. Um, so warnings tonight, um, but also hope that if there is action, things can change. And, and what a beautiful production uh, for the Arch tonight. And also quite crucial, the launch of that uh, Tutu Legacy Fund uh, mm. being launched today, uh, basically to foster youth-led uh, change and uh, climate change, of course, being one of uh, the issues uh, that will take center stage uh, with regard to that and next week i think is mama leah's birthday yes so yes birthday messages for yeah. the arch and uh, leah herself as well uh, because that is just a few days apart oh absolutely